So as promised, I want to talk about how we build the most strength and muscle possible. So uh, of all of the things that we could talk about, uh, I, I want to start off making sure that we definitely cover a little bit of the physiology first. And then I'm going to talk about some of the research, some of the, the debates that happen in, in the exercise science world. And then, of course, hit some application points. So I'm going to try not to be too um, remedial on, on the, the, the physiology. But at the same time, I think there are a lot of people who may even watch this on the playback that, that this could have some new information. So when you think of muscle contraction more than anything, even though I'm going to go over muscle fiber types and energy systems, I want you to think first that, you know, muscle tissue connects bones and you can see there the, the, the tendon and, and it's connected to a bone that actually kind of becomes continuous. You know, it's not like this thing just, just connects like a, a thumbtack. It actually, the tendon becomes calcified and, and just kind of ingrained in there. The tendon also becomes more, uh, you know, muscle as it gets toward the, the other end of the, the tendon. And a, a lot of how we look is genetically determined by the way these things are structurally carried through our DNA. So tendon lengths and muscle lengths can be different in different people. The insertion points on bones can be slightly different. And so some people can just be genetically a lot stronger than other people. Uh, some people can have a lot fuller, rounder muscle tissue than others. And so I know, for example, in, in bikini competitors, Everybody wants the biggest, roundest, fullest glutes and biggest shoulders. And, and you can see some competitors from behind when they're lean enough, and it looks like their glutes almost insert, you know, below the halfway point on their femur. And then other people, it's up a little higher, a little bit more lateral, kind of toward the greater trochanter. And they wonder, you know, why can't I get my glutes as big as so-and-so? I can, I can do a hip thrust with 800 pounds. And it all has to do with, with our genetics. Uh, when I was speaking with Brett Contreras a couple of weeks ago, you know, he was kind of being self-deprecating and said, you know, I, I can deadlift 630 pounds and yet I've got the smallest, flattest ass, you know, of anybody, you know, everybody kind of makes fun of me because I'm the glute guy and, and I don't have any glutes and, you know, genetics are genetics. And, and it's, it's amazing, you know, he'll, he'll show slides of his different clients and, you know, go through, you know, who's the strongest, et cetera. There, there's not a lot of correlation to how strong you are, to what you, you look like physiologically in terms of muscle development. Both of those are genetically determined. So you know, if, if you're here hoping for a miracle, I want to I wanna get you as far down the road as we can in terms of you having the ability to maximally control your strength and your training and, and your development. But at the same time, you have to realize that there are some boundaries uh, to that genetically. And uh, sorry for some of the um, quality of these slides. This is what you get from Google Images. Sometimes they're just not high res. But uh, once you understand that every single muscle tissue, you know, has that component that it's approximating two bones. So think of, for example, something as simple as a bicep. You know, that the tendon is actually down on uh, your your lower limb, your lower arm, and it originates up, you know, at your shoulder. And and ironically, there are two. In certain origin points, because it's a it's a two joint muscle, uh, one part in, or originates back on the scapula, one on the actual humerus. But for the sake of just a simple argument or, or simple illustration, I want you to think of it as just one mechanism. It just flexes your elbow. It just approximates your lower limb to your upper limb, your your ulna and radius to your humerus. So that's what it does. That those muscle contractions even though they can be very complex movements like a squat or a deadlift or a sprint, every single muscle in its own synchrony is just simply shortening. That's all it does. So if I'm doing a squat and I'm pushing up with my legs, it, it, at some points, my quads are extending toward the knee, sometimes extending uh, at the hip, my glutes are, are extending, they're pulling backwards, my hamstrings and adductors have a play in this. And, and that is all motor unit control. That's your central nervous system controlling the pattern of, of those, those muscle firings. And that's why it, it's something to be trained. This, this is a point I'm going to bring up a little bit later, but, but think of a, a child, like my, my almost six month old grandson, you know, for, 
you know, the first two months of his life, you know, he's like a little bobblehead doll. He can't even hold his head up straight, you know, and now all of a sudden he's rolling around and crawling and perfectly still and can almost stand. And in just four to five months, you know, he's developed a massive amount of neuromuscular control through the cerebellum and central nervous system, the brainstem for that kind of stability and strength and movement. And what we do in terms of training has several components of, of strength, of actual um, synchrony, as I said, and then even how powerfully our nervous system can contract that muscle tissue. So one thing I want to note real quick is that every single muscle itself, like the biceps, or let's say the long head of the biceps, that there are groups and groups of, of muscle fibers and those motor units, if you see this, this picture of a, of a motor neuron and then the, the axon where you, you're, you're recruiting that particular bundle of muscle fiber, you can have thousands of muscle fibers in one unit, all controlled by one small nerve, or it could be something super, super fine motor controlled, like the movements of your eye or something like that. So wherever you have a muscle that has more gross muscle pattern responsibility, like your quadricep, every single nerve is probably going to control a large, large section of muscle fibers. But again, it's all about just shortening that muscle tissue. That's all it does. So strength training and hypertrophy can be really simple because all we have to think about is that these muscle fibers are going to contract. And so by what angle am I going to contract to create the most force? How much load do I use? How many reps, how many sets, what's the intensity, what's the volume, what's the frequency of my training per week, duration of you know training per workout. You have all of these variables, but it still comes down to what's happening to those individual muscle fibers. Matter of fact, I will go one step further and say it has a lot to do with what happens in the little sections of each muscle fiber. So the way a muscle fiber contracts, you have these filaments. And if you look at the, the little myosin filament uh, in the middle there, you know, that literally ratchets the actin filaments together. So these two Z lines, these big black lines that are, are vertical, they are sections of the muscle that just shorten. And then they lengthen to, to eccentrically let the muscle relax. And they're just doing that every single rep. So how you contract the muscle, there's even a point I'm gonna show you in here about your, your mental focus and how much force you can exert uh, over that, that contraction just through your mind. Um, you know, it reminded me of the, the old Joe Weider mind muscle connection principle, but, but it was something that Brad Schoenfeld brought up in a particular study. So I'm gonna get, I'm not gonna get too deep into some of this stuff. Uh, anybody who has questions, we can, we can maybe follow up, um, you know, through social media on, on some, some things like that. I'm also not gonna cover some things like hormonal response, which, which is part of this. Um, of all the theories of, of muscle growth and muscle contraction and, and muscle strength, uh, I think everybody agrees that the dominant factors are really mechanical, what's happening there. Uh, obviously things like hormones, testosterone and so forth have, have a play in that, but it really has to do with more the, the stimulus that you put, you know, into the muscle tissue and then how you handle all these variables. So, um, so this actually looks like the bicep here. Uh, but I want to, I want to go through the fact that not only do we have the, the muscle physiology to consider and what, what our goal really is in the movement, but the fact that there are different types of muscle fiber. So uh, you guys who were here a couple of weeks ago, when we talked about this. Uh, the, the main two breakdowns are type one and type two. These are the kind of the classic models. And type one is a slow twitch muscle fiber, meaning it's primarily there for postural contraction. So it's very good at endurance, your, your, your back musculature for posture in your legs for holding you up while you're standing those are dominantly type one. Uh, type two, fast twitch are also, you know, called white muscle fiber because they're less vascular for that reason. They primarily take care of more explosive contractions for strength and power. And, uh, you know, th these are, it's not like one particular muscle is 90% one fiber type or even 100%. Every single muscle group in your body or muscle 
probably a 40 to 60 split at the absolute most. Uh, every muscle has a, a good mix of these different types of fibers. Uh, could be 45, 65, could be even closer. But how we train them because of how they have uh, evolved, you know, for their different functions really does matter. How you train and get response from a, a type one muscle fiber is different than a type two muscle fiber. So think of it as the, the type one slow twitch is, you know, like I said, postural, maybe it's, you know, kind of jogging. It's, it's very vascular. So there are a lot of mitochondria there. You're, you're able to turn over energy over time. They're, they're very attuned to using oxygen as energy. So more of the aerobic energy system. Then you jump all the way over to type 2B. And those are the, the fast twitch, which would be, as in this illustration, somebody sprinting. This is where you can, you're going to really explode into a rep or, a, or an exercise and, and you're going to primarily use ATP as your energy source, or you're going to be resynthesizing energy ATP through, through creatine. And, and then you have kind of in the middle, the type 2A fiber, which become more of the, you know, kind of, kind of using fast twitch, but for more reps or more distance, you're getting 20, 30, 60 seconds down the road. And these type 2A fibers, interestingly, can adapt to how you train. So if you specialize, that's really their evolutionary role. Whatever you need, you know, these type 2A fibers kind of make up the difference. They bridge between type 1 and type 2B. Uh, so they're almost, you know, res responsible for kind of an epigenetic function in that you, you will be able to, quote, evolve to meet your demands, you know, right now. You don't have to wait for a thousand generations. So I, I kind of went over this already. I'll probably skip a little of this, but just a little bit more explanation of the muscle fibers. So you have the the the, the two or three different types of muscle fibers. I, I would I would think of it just as two for now for simplicity: the fast twitch and the slow twitch. So fast twitch for power, explosiveness, strength. Slow twitch, you're going to need more reps. They can tolerate more because they're more conditioned for that. They're they're more, um, you know, cardiovascularly dense. So we actually have, man, talk about bad quality here. You can't read that at all. Uh, the, the energy system. So uh, as I mentioned, a, a muscle tissue, when it first starts contracting, you're going to use ATP as energy. It's what's right there for the cell uh, to, to just move, the muscle cell to contract whatsoever. And you only have so much of that in that muscle cell. And so that's why it's really only used for in, in terms of rep ranges, we often say, you know, 10 reps, 12 reps, somewhere in that range. If you're, if you're thinking of an athletic function, it's more like a hundred meter sprint, you know, you get about 10 seconds into that with maximum, maximum, maximum exertion. And then that's all you've got. Then you would have to decrease that load somehow. If you're running, you have to slow down. If you're doing some kind of a weight resistance movement, then you have to lighten the load. So think of like a drop set. And so then you can keep going, but now that you've run out of ATP, now you're starting to use glucose. Now you've triggered the fact that your, your, your nervous system says, okay, you know, I, I, I'm, I still have a demand, you know, I'm still moving. So I have to, I, you know, ATP is long gone. That will be resynthesized as it can be but now you start using glucose as energy, the actual muscle glycogen right there in the muscle cell. And, and you get, you know, depending on your conditioning, you can get a couple minutes of this. So, so think of the, that track scenario where you've been sprinting for hundred meters and that's all you got. I mean, you, you could not have taken one step farther or faster. You put it all on the line for hundred meters. Now let's say, you're on the track and you're going to, you're going to run a quarter mile. So now you're going to do a full lap. Well, you definitely can't keep up that pace. So you pull back a little bit. You're still running as hard as you can, but you know, you're going to be out of energy in 45 to 60 seconds. That's when you are, you have now used all of your ATP, all of the muscle glucose glycogen that you can right there. But what if your goal was to run a mile or two miles or a marathon then you pull the pace back even further. You start out, if anybody's a runner, like you'll, you'll know what I'm saying when you kind of start out running and you start breathing hard and, and you feel like this is, this is really kind of painful. And then you hit a kind of a break point where all of a sudden your physi physiological response kind of settles down and then it becomes easier. 
And that's because your body transitioned from ATP and glycogen now into using oxygen as energy. So now you're into the aerobic uh, energy system, which is using oxygen as energy. And of course, you know, with a light enough load or light enough pace, you could, you could do this for a very long time. So all of this matters in how we're going to train the muscle tissue because we, we need to know the difference between the two muscle fiber types, because if I'm just doing one style of training, I may be losing out on, on the maximum response to half of my actual muscle tissue, because I only train in one kind of rep range or one, one training style. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm only training in, in maximum you know, loads, where it's always just you know, four to, to six reps or, or six to 10 reps, maybe I'm always just using ATP, I never get good at using the glycolytic energy system, which is what I really need to tap into my, my slow twitch muscle fiber. That, that's how they're going to respond and grow. You also won't put the, the metabolic demand on the muscle tissue to create more mitochondria and become more efficient. You know, actually, uh, you know, being able to pull in and metabolize nutrients better for muscle recovery and growth. So the, the kind of powerlifting crowd who just wants to do, you know, a couple reps and be done, a couple reps and be done. It, it's a huge disservice compared to somebody who really trains more holistically through the different energy systems and hitting different muscle fiber types. I think some of the breakthrough moments in the history of exercise science is when people started using a lot of uh, different styles of training in terms of angles and so forth. I think of Louis Simmons, you know, instead of just deadlifting every week, all of a sudden people are doing, you know, Nordic hamstring curls and, and, you know, cable pull throughs and glute ham raises and that kind of thing. Uh, because now you're working from different angles and then working with different rep ranges. You think of the European bloc countries and kind of the Bulgarian and Romanian styles of training where they're doing, you know, 10 sets of 10 instead of just always going for that max rep. Uh, so some of these things were quite innovative in their times because they were just simply working the muscle tissue more completely. And that gave everybody a huge advantage. So here's another look at uh, those different energy systems. And uh, they even throw in kind of a fourth, which is your, your ATP actually depletes pretty quickly, but then it starts to resynthesize, like I said, the creatine phosphate system, but then the lactic acid or glycolytic system, you know, will go out for about two minutes. And then the aerobic system will, will kind of take you as far as you want to go. But now I, I want to take all that information. So I want you to think of the actual physical movement. And I'm not going to, spend a lot of time here. So hold this in the back of your mind, the physical movement. For example, if I want to squat and I can squat, let's say 500 pounds and I, and I even go to, you know, past 90 degrees, I've got good form. There's a certain amount of load that is now spread out over my whole body. I mean, from my neck to my feet, everything is contracting to either move that weight or stabilize while I'm moving that weight. But at the same time, it's not necessarily a direct stimulus to my quadricep. If I do a leg extension, now I'm isolating that muscle tissue, but maybe I can only do 140, 160 pounds, and then I'm kind of tapped out. So what's actually better? 400 pounds of force through my quads with a multi-joint movement or much, much, much less force, you know, through an isolated movement. And I... I would hope you guys are kind of beyond this in terms of your own education in, in muscle physiology. The answer would be you need both, but it kind of depends on your goals. You know, obviously it depends on whether you're a, an Olympic sprinter, a, a pole vaulter, you're a basketball player, you're a bodybuilder. It really matters what you're after strength, hypertrophy, and so forth. Uh, I'm, I'm always going to kind of come back to the center point and say, I, I want to make sure I'm not leaving any gaps. I, I, I want functionality. I want balance. I'm, I'm a physical therapist. I don't, I don't want to overdevelop, you know, in strength in one side of a joint and not the other and end up with, with arthritic changes or injuries, things like that. Uh, but at the same time, there can be specialization. Uh, you know, Brett Contreras just put out a video, I think, where he's talking about how, you know, bikini competitors just need glutes and shoulders. So why would you spend all of your time training your back and chest? You don't need it you know, let your body physiologically recover by giving more 
volume and duration and frequency to the muscle groups that you need to develop and not as much in those other areas. I can't argue that point, but I still don't like it. I, I still want people to have some kind of functional balance. And, and I think the strengthening kind of works everywhere. You know, when, when you're working your back and your chest, your shoulders are going to benefit from that. Uh, I think you can end up injured if, if you're just training one thing really aggressively, and then you're avoiding other parts of that kinetic chain. So, so there's the actual angle, there's the actual movement, then you have to think about the energy system and the fiber type for the, for the exact style of training you're going to use. And to be honest, this is all just kind of background noise. This is foundational. When you get into the actual variables that you will control, it's going to be, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about frequency. We're going to talk about load. We're going to talk about uh, one or two other variables, but this, this particular slide right here in the next one is what you have to manage or you will never get where you want to go. So I hope you recognize this in the fact that that upward trend means if, if you look at this first green arrow here or this first little pinpoint on the A or the, the X, Y axis, that's your training stimulus. This is when you work out and you're going to create some muscle disruption. You know, the, the muscle is fatigued. It's, it's, you know, micro strained in some ways. You put this demand on the muscle where you have to have some sense of recovery and your body does start to recover. You know, there's initially soreness and fatigue and disruption, and then your body starts to come back up to its baseline and it will even go a little further to compensate because now you're, you're adding uh, proteins, you're increasing protein synthesis to the muscle fibers, it's getting stronger. And at that point, if you train right at the top of full recovery, then you'll, you'll repeat this cycle and your super compensation will be a little bit higher. But what if you train too frequently and you're actually, you know, you haven't even fully recovered and you train again, you haven't fully recovered and you train again, you can train yourself into kind of an overreach or overtraining position and in ultimately injury, you know, certainly zero progress. So the way you manage this is through your training load, your training frequency, a couple of these other variables we're going to talk about. But if you are not recovering, you will not make progress. But that's that's only one side of the equation. That's kind of the passive side. The active side is what kind of training stimulus are you are you providing? So here's another uh, picture that I like a little bit better, except I think there's a huge flaw. So this shows the, the degrees of severity of the stimulus. So let's say you have this nice little stimulus response and then you come up and just like I showed earlier, there's that super compensation phase. But what if you train just a little bit harder? What if you had more volume? So you did a few more sets or more intensity in intensity, meaning, you know, relative to your one, one rep max. So it was actually a heavier load then you're going to, you're going to drop down here a little bit deeper, which means you're going to, you're going to require a little bit more. You're going to potentially get more super compensation. Now here's, here's where this is a really horrible slide. And that's why I picked it. It shows that this person training a little bit easier, lighter, and this person who went a little bit deeper, they're both hitting that level of recovery at the same point. That's never going to happen. The harder you train, the more stimulus you create in terms of muscle disruption, it's going to go out farther, which means time. It's going to take you more days to actually recover. So this person showed it on this particular line. This is somebody training. Here's what, here's what the slide says first, training too hard. So if you train so aggressively that you get a deeper training stimulus, and a, and a resulting response, whoever created this slide rightly showed that it takes longer to recover. But look, they showed that eh, you don't even get you don't even get any super compensation. Nothing happens at all, which is 100 percent wrong. You would actually get a higher super compensation because your body is is going through more disruption. And so you get the signal 
that that you need, you know, to you need those myofibrils to be bigger, thicker, stronger to sustain that again. I'll give you an example just through Wolf's Law, uh, which is, you know, how your bone remodels uh, either after a bone break or if you go up into space, you know, you have zero gravity and you come back down. Whatever, whatever the stimulus is, your body is going to respond to that. So if you are training harder and you're creating more disruption, you're going to get more benefit, but it's going to take a longer time to recover, which means you cannot train that particular muscle group or that particular exercise as frequently. So that's where you're doing major, major disruption. Again, going back to some of the the foundational strength training people from the, the 70s and 80s, the coaches who are going over to the Eastern Bloc countries, that's when they started learning how to periodize. That's when they would say, okay, if we're going to do one rep max squats, we're only going to do that once a week or once every two weeks. But what if we had some other training days when we don't train quite as hard? What if we just do, you know, 10 by 10s? Or what if we only train at 60% of our one rep max for like five reps? So we're kind of working on form. It's more of an active recovery. Does that have any benefit? Because if you train to that maximum threshold, you, you, you're going to risk either not being able to recover or you're simply going to have to wait longer in between. So there's this huge debate right now on training frequency. And the answer is all right here in this chart. How are you going to manage this? And, and I think this is, this, is, this is kind of appropriate. You know, this person says these three words embody the principles of all successful training programs, continuity, gradualness, and modulation. Modulation for sure, because you need to know how to modulate these, these training variables so that you're always recovered and, and you're always creating what you want as the best response. I'm not going to say any one of these three examples is wrong. Absolutely not. There are some days you want to train for a lighter training response. Some days when you want something a little bit deeper, some days when you really want to go for it. So, Here's a here, here's the biggest research review I'm going to I'm going to present to you guys today. And it's a, and it's a fairly new one. Um, you guys may recognize the name, you know, Stuart Phillips, but uh, they went through, I believe they looked at about 50 or 53, I think was the number of different studies. And, and when you do a meta analysis, you don't just look at everything that's ever been done. You have to kind of pre qualify every study to make sure it fits the parameters of which you are trying to interpret. And so they wanted to look at training for strength and hypertrophy, those two things separately. You know, what are the differences? What are the similarities? And uh, this is always funny to me, an evidence-based approach. Like, I mean, that, that's like saying water is wet. And, you know, we're doing research, we're doing a meta analysis, but we have to qualify it as evidence-based. That's the entire definition of research. Anyway, that's just become such a cliche in today's world that makes me laugh. Um, but here are the highlights. So, so uh, I'm going to read through these. I apologize. I know it's kind of boring to hear somebody read some stuff, but, but some of these are important and I want to emphasize them. Uh, changes in muscle mass and strength were me mediated by the FITT principles. Frequency, intensity, type, and time. Frequency is how many times you actually train per week. Intensity, uh, there's kind of a couple definitions. The, the, the classic definition in, in exercise science is your percent of one rep max. Uh, but at the same time, they use it as volitional fatigue. You know, how, how deep am I going? Am, am I somebody who does, you know, 10 reps and, and owie, it starts to burn and I put it down. Or, I, you know, I do 10 reps and then I do 10 more. And, you know, the last five, my spotter had to help me because I couldn't even lift that. You know, a lot of times in gyms, that's what we call intensity. So there's a little bit of subjectiveness to that. Um, I'll talk about some of those differences when we get into the study. You know, the type is the exercise selection that I mentioned earlier, you know, exactly how you're going to do that. And, and then, of course, the time, how many, you know, how, how much time you're spending in the gym, all of that. Some of the other variables, like I mentioned, uh, I'll, I'll probably just describe them at the end, but they, everybody concludes they're just not the biggest players in how you're going to respond. So here, here's something I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point out one sentence here, but I'm going to kind of skim it for you. Resistance exercise training induced increases in voluntary one rep max strength if great, are greater 
if the if the exercise is performed with higher loads of the strength test. So this is kind of another no brainer. If you want to get stronger, lift heavier weights. That's what that says. The higher you get toward a one rep max with your training is how you get stronger. But they said when you're training for hypertrophy, training load, meaning that percent of one rep max isn't always necessary. You really can stick to higher rep ranges, never quite risk going for that heavier weight, and you can still get almost all of the benefit in hypertrophy. Now, this is another thing I don't like because I'm a guy who's been training for 40 years and I like to train heavy because it's fun. It's, it's part of our ego culture. It's, you know, how much can you bench, bro? And, and you grow up kind of doing that. But it's also, I, I think even outside of those social contexts, it just is fun. It's, it, you know, it, it, it's why you do that. Um, you know, why did I climb that mountain? Because it was there. You know, that's, that's inside the mind of every person in the gym at some point. If I can do 100 pounds this week, wouldn't it be great to do 150? Oh, look at that person doing 200. I want to do that now. And there is a sense that the stronger my muscle tissue gets, I can do higher weight within those higher rep ranges. So if I can only do 10 reps of squats, like, you know, thinking back to when I was 14 or 15 years old, let's say I could only squat 95 pounds for 10 reps. Well, now if I can squat 400 pounds for 10 reps, don't you think those reps have a different response in my body for muscle growth? There's two parts to that answer. Yes, there is a certain percentage, but actually not as much as you think. So you, you guys who have been with me for a long time, think back to what I've talked about in terms of how much gross muscle mass we can gain over time. If I showed you a picture of me at 20 years old and a picture of me at 40 years old, and I said, here I am in contest shape, I'm 4% body fat in each photo, you would look at the picture of me at 40 and, and I've had people say that I looked as much as 30 pounds heavier, like you'd gained 30 pounds of muscle. Some people guess 15 or 20, and I was the exact same weight. Uh, every drug-free, performance enhancement drug-free person that's ever trained like that in the sport of bodybuilding, from, from a Dave Gooden to a Brian Whitaker, same thing. You just don't gain that much gross muscle mass over time, you, you gain 90 to 95% of what you will ever gain in your first year of training. So there's actually some validity to the fact that you don't have to engage in super high risky overload to build muscle, to change the shape of your muscle, to build density. But if you're in it for strength, you absolutely have to push for strength. Uh, just understand that you, you, know, you, you don't have to quite risk as much. And so the people who go into the gym and they always want to max out, they always want to you know, lift as heavy as possible, A, they're going to re, uh, you know, in increase their risk of injury. They're going to uh, increase their need for recovery. So now they can't train with as much frequency or duration. Uh, and again, that's part of that's okay. If that's the way you like to train, if that has something to do with your goals, but it's not quite, you know, as much as people think. So let's look a little bit more closely now at, at the actual load, the amount of weight you're going to use. Um, I think I just kind of said all this, but, uh, you know, if you get above 85% of your one rep max, that's when you actually create a, a substantial increase in strength potential gain. But you have to cycle this. You, you have to be able to go into the gym, as I mentioned earlier, and not do this every single time you're in the gym. Sometimes you don't even do that movement. When, when one of my friends who is a, you know, he, he was a, a, a former world record holder in the squat. He also was a strength coach with a Div division one school. He, he won back to back national championships in division one powerlifting with zero scholarship money. So he couldn't go recruit the best lifters in a, in a weight room that's as big as my office, actually smaller than my office with borrowed equipment, donated equipment from local high schools. It, it, this is at the University of Evansville. And he was the first coach in NCAA history to have every single weight class squat over 600 pounds. The guy was a phenomenal coach. And he used a lot of those Eastern block 
uh, techniques where you know you know you might only deadlift once a month, but the other lifts during that 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 month were all about you know hamstring, core, glutes. Uh, you know, replicating that movement with different forms of hyperextensions, reverse hypers, glute ham raises. So you you don't always have to train in that particular movement to progress that movement. There are other parts of the kinetic chain. But here's what's really interesting. I, I want you guys to catch this. Um, I think it's on this slide. Um, as you practice heavier training, one of the notes that they have in some of these studies is that you just simply get better at that motion. This is kind of a Mike Zordos philosophy is that sometimes just the act of going through the repetitions, even if you're not going for a, a huge training response, especially for a, a novice lifter, it's learning those mechanics, you know, go back to the, the, the illustration of my six month old grandson, you know, it's the motion, it's the repetitions, it's, it's learning those biomechanics, your central nervous system learns to recruit those muscle patterns more efficiently. Your, your central nervous system learns to recruit the actual motor units with more synchrony and more force. Uh, there, there are ways to even train how well you can track muscle tissue without a, a you know, heavy, heavy load. Uh, I was down at the University of South Florida and with uh, different different ways of, of you know using dynamometers, you know you can you can measure static strength against an isometric thing. So so you're like on a leg extension and you push against it as hard as you can, but it doesn't move. And so you're measuring how much force you can generate, or you can do something like on a bench press with a, a force wire, and it's just the bar, but you go as hard as you can. So you come down, touch your chest, and then when it's time to go, it's like bam as hard as you can. You feel like you're going to throw the bar through the ceiling. And they're measuring velocity and force production, you know, in a, in a dynamic way, these things can be practiced. So you get better at the movements, even, you know, you know, without necessarily the load. So, so another thing to consider that it's not always about these variables, it's about your technique, but now let's talk about volume real quick. Uh, regardless increased volume or volume load does not beyond a certain point necessarily augment uh, training induced changes in muscular strength. So, so now they, they found there's kind of a sweet spot where the amount of volume, if you get in the gym and you do, you know, just two or three sets, maybe you don't get many results, much re result. If you do 20 or 30 sets, maybe you also have a law of diminishing returns. There's a place where you get, you know, the, the benefit you're going to get. And then, then that's it. The law of diminishing return kicks in. So here's what's interesting, and, I, and I'm going to argue this point as well. They say that it seems like you need to do more than three sets, of course. You know, I mean, if, if I were only doing three sets of an exercise per muscle group per week, seems pretty minimal, right? But if I'm brand new to training, that may be appropriate. Uh, but it says when you get above 15 sets and, and th they have their citations, it seems to start to decline your ability to recover. So in other words, you're just grinding and grinding and doing more work. It's not necessarily creating benefits, but it is impeding your ability to recover. So if I were keeping a scoreboard, I would say this is kind of a point for the people who are for lower volume per workout. But I would argue this, it absolutely has everything to do with your training experience in your adapted capacity for training. In other words, if you're an Olympic sprinter who's been doing this for 15 years, practicing your sprints and you're in the gym and you're doing all of your training versus somebody in middle school, you need a different amount of, of all of these variables, including duration. If I went in the gym right now and I said, I'm just gonna do three sets of squats, that's gonna be enough for the week, I wouldn't even be warmed up yet. I'm not even I'm not even close to even feeling like I'm engaging the muscle tissue, but I've been training for a long time. My max strength is high enough that I need more sets of warming up to even get to those max reps, and I have the conditioning for it. My muscle tissue has been conditioned for that for decades, and so it, it, it again going back to Wolf's law for me. I need a certain level of stimuli to even move the needle to hope that I get more. 
that's different from somebody just getting started. That's different from somebody who's just been in the gym, um, you know, a, a couple couple years. But remember where we get a lot of this research. Where is where is most of the research done? It's on college campuses by graduate students being supervised by TAs and professors. And so your subjects are typically younger. I remember when I was at the IU Med Center, IU Med School, every single school was constantly doing research. The nurses were doing research, the dentists were doing research, the physical therapists were doing research. So there were all of these, you know, posters all over where you could go get, you know, you could get paid 10 bucks or hundred bucks to be in this study, be in that study. And, uh, and so all of these tend to be in a little bit of a younger group, you know, college students, those are a lot of the subjects. They tend to be shorter duration. You're not going to do a five-year study in, in exercise science. It's going to be six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks is a marathon study. And so you're looking at all of these things and you're trying to interpret in, in this short amount of time, can we mathematically predict that this, this result would continue for a year or two or 20? And it just won't. It absolutely won't because dynamically, biologically, we do not stay the same in terms of a, a trained organism. So I, I look at some of these these things, the, these inferences that say, you know, hey, three reps, you need at least three, but oh, never, never more than 15 reps per muscle group per week. Absolutely untrue unless you're just getting started. Um, I, I even think of a, one of my own coaches and clients who as kind of an exercise, I wanted him to program his own training and, and so he created this whole spreadsheet with, with a five day system and, and some of it looked okay, but some of it was like, just randomly, like, here's this upper body workout. And there are three sets of leg extensions. Like, well, I, well, I wanted to train quads three times a week. And I'm like, you think three sets of extensions are going to do anything for you. And then another workout would be, you know, pull downs for your lats, shoulder press for this hip abduction for this. And I'm like, there is no rhyme, reason, or synchrony to this. Like, what do you, you know, he goes, well, I was just, you know, trying to fit it in. I'm, I'm trying to train each muscle group three or four times a week. And it's like, you just have to end up like throwing stuff together. I'm pretty sure that's not physiologically how you get your greatest results. You know, let, let me transfer that to another sport, for example, like, like basketball. Are you going to say, okay, you know, first we're going to, you know, shoot some free throws and then we're going to run some sprints and then we'll go do some push ups, and then we'll go do this and then we'll do that. And then like, there has to be a flow to what you're doing and creating. I, th I think you guys intuitively know that, you know, that's why you do things like, you know, pre-exhaustion work with a superset or, you know, you save your primary, you know, uh, lifts for the beginning where you're, where you're stronger. And so I, I think some research that you can read like this is very misleading and it makes people believe there's just some kind of secret algorithm. Like, here's how much frequency I need. Here's how much load. And so it's like, I'm going to use this percent of one rep max for this and this, this many reps in reserve. And as long as I get it in, but the actual flow of your workout, I, I think matters more than, than people give credence to. So let me, let me jump in here. I'm going to have to speed this up a little bit. Uh, so frequency for strength, increasing the number of weekly training sessions uh, is a viable way to increase volume and volume load. Uh, however, when both volume, when, when volume is unmatched and matched, so two different things, then frequencies do not independently improve. So what that means is if I'm doing all of my sets for strength in one workout, let's, let's say I want to do 12, 12 sets for my squat. Am I going to do 12 sets one day a week? Am I going to do six sets two days a week? Am I going to do four sets three days a week? Again, you have to go back to rep ranges and, and what kind of fiber type response you're even going for. But in a lot of research, they just don't go that deep. They just look at, hey, let's just make this group do it this. Kind of like my, my client and coach that I said, it seems so random. That's how some of these studies are done. It's just, hey, you guys go do six sets twice a week. You guys do three, you guys do this, and we're, we're going to measure. And I just don't think there's much translation into what we actually can can take from this, except from the extremes. And so I'm going to get to some concluding remarks here uh, in a minute. But that was all for strength. 
Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna bounce back to hypertrophy. So this is what I already said, that, that you just don't necessarily need a lot of strength work for hypertrophy. And I, I, mm, this would be tough. I mean, because if, if you want to take somebody's 20 or 30 or 40 year lifting career and say, let's say we had two clones, identical twins, and one person trained this way for 30 years, one person trained this year for 30 years. I think the person who trained heavier not, not heaviest, you don't have to, again, we're talking about hypertrophy. We're not talking about training a power lifter, but somebody who just wants muscular growth, muscular development, the person who still has some heavy work cycled in, I think will always have the advantage because A, we're working on more of those, those fast twitch muscle fibers. Those are the ones that are not only responsible for uh, explosive strength type movements, they have a higher capacity genetically for growth, for hypertrophy. So if you're not training heavy, you're going to miss a large portion of your potential growth. So again, you know, studies like this, even with all these citations that say, yeah, you don't really need it. I mean, are you talking about a 5% reduction, a 10% reduction, which sounds good. Like, hey, you can get 90% of your growth without lifting too heavy. Well, I, you know, maybe that's okay for somebody. If you're Brad Pitt and you just don't want to be really big, but you want to be fit, then yeah, don't train heavy. But you guys who want the biggest delts, the biggest quads, the biggest glutes, you, you're going to have to do some heavy work. So I think you have to discount some of this, you know, quote research. Um, you know, volume again, they, they kind of go back to that, that cliche response. You know, you, you want to stay less than 15 sets per week you know, that, that's kind of variable. Again, it goes back to your training style. It goes back to your perceived intensity. Uh, I, I told you guys a couple of days ago that, that I'm somebody who always trained, a, you know, with, it's, it's hard for me to not train with maximum effort. And so when my powerlifting coach said, I can help you get your squat from 500 pounds to 600 pounds. And he just couldn't do that, even though he had, he's the guy who won these national championships and so forth. It's because I would always train too hard in each set, not every set, but, but as, as a collective over time. And so he wanted to add more frequency to my training and, and my intensity level was always just a little too high. So too much frequency did not work for me. I still got, I, I still got my squat from, you know, 135 pounds in high school to 500 pounds, 20 years later, I did fine, but I had to know what worked for me based on some of those intangible variables. So going back to frequency, um, here, here's where a lot of people have come down to the fact that you, you should train muscle groups two to three times a week, but cycle the load, cycle the intensity uh, for your best results. And, and a lot of people like Mike Zordos have really tried to figure this out. You know, what would be the perfect rep scheme, the, the perfect flow? And this is why they, they created, you know, perceived intensity and reps in reserve. So, some, some, some great ideas to try and figure this out. But at the same time, that's different for every person. It's different physiologically and it's different psychologically. So for some people, training two or three times a week uh, is, is going to just be a catastrophe. It's too much. For some people, it may work. It really depends on your even level of training. I use this as an example the other day. Uh, as a physical therapist, when I would walk into a hospital and somebody had a stroke or they just had surgery and, and they've been bedridden for a long time, if I just do 10 sit-to-stand stand transfers that may be an unbelievable training response for somebody who's been in bed for, for two weeks. But yet you can recover pretty quickly because it was a partial range of motion and there wasn't that much load. So maybe we can do that every day. So some of these people who say, I want to squat every day. Well, if you squat that light in a partial range of motion, maybe you could do that. And I remember some people, like I think it was Ben Escrow, it was certainly Mike Zordos. I spoke at a conference with them and they said, hey, we did these great studies. We just wanted to get way out there and see what was possible. So we wanted to see if you could do max benching 30 days in a row and show progress. We wanted to see if you could squat every single day for 30 days to see what would happen. And they showed that people's, re that like th their 
their progress actually went down initially. They were getting weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. And then eventually they would start to adapt and they would come back. And by the end of 30 days, they were just a little bit over baseline. So they said, look, we proved you could do it. But by the way, we had this, this many people who had to buy out because of injuries and this many people, you know, and, and, and a handful of these guys have, have personally had career ending injuries because they've tried to train with such increased frequency that it has literally broken them. And that's why I'm a much bigger proponent of, of having better recovery. Because if you think training two or three times means that you have to squat all three times to train your legs, you're, you're mistaken, obviously. When, when For example, a, a classic illustration, when you're doing chest, you're killing your shoulders. When you're doing back, you're killing your shoulders. When you're squatting, you're killing your shoulders. So even if you only train shoulders once a week, you're already training shoulders probably four or five times a week. So you have to understand some of that overlap as it equates to, to frequency. Um, this was a really interesting aside. Schoenfeld even showed that, that another, another definition of intensity is your perception. How hard am I focusing on that contraction? Am I just moving the weight or am I actively consciously trying to contract that, that muscle harder? Can I, can I force my body, my nervous system to actually recruit more motor units? And obviously you can. So even something as hard to define and hard to measure like that can have an effect. So let me, let me go back to uh, something now here by that even Brad did in terms of frequency, you know, this huge debate about frequency. Um, I, I like this approach and, and Brad is a very temperate guy. I, I appreciate his, uh, his perspective and his stance on things. He doesn't necessarily have an agenda to prove, but uh, he came down to this. I'm going to skip down a little bit. No significant differences were seen between frequencies of training across all categories when taking into account direct measures of growth. Uh, in those considered resistance trained when segmenting into training for the upper body, lower body, meta regression analysis of non volume equated studies show a significant effect favoring higher frequencies. So, so he thinks, again, that higher frequencies like training that muscle group more often per week, but just cycling the load and so forth. But the frequency of one, be, be, the frequency between one and three days was very modest. There was not that much difference. If you just train a muscle group once a week or two or three times, he said it was an incredibly modest difference. He said, therefore, you can choose to train one, two, three times a week, but in their own meta analysis, and this was one that they did looking at over 25 studies. They said total work matters more than anything. You know, how many actual sets? So if you're going to train like I personally like, which is to go into a workout, warm up really well, and then make that workout count. You know, when I deadlift, when I squat, I am thoroughly going through that workout, but then I'm not going to be able to do that movement again. I'm probably not going to be able to even train that body part, even from a different angle with different exercises for three or four days. So I'm not going to do, uh, you know, a muscle group three or four times a week again, because of my training maturity, you know, my, my physical, you know, amount of years and, and, and frequency and duration I've had over 40 years of training, I need to get a little bit better training response and then to get back up to the training compensation, super compensation, but that's, that's a very advanced lifter. And it, and it shows in these meta analyses that that's okay. You can train once, twice, three times a week, really depends on you. But here's, here's kind of the bottom line. There are a lot of things we can take from this, but there are a lot of things that we will probably never be able to answer because they are so intangible. Uh, we, they, they don't even study necessarily. I would love to do a study on periodization technique now that I'm building my own training lab again you know, maybe I'll have enough people that I can do this where I say, okay, you guys, it, your universities, <clears throat> you do these six week studies, whatever. I'm going to do a two year study and I'm going to do different periodization models instead of just, well, are we going to train, you know, this muscle group three times a week or two and measure that I'm going to train different protocols and progressions and see, because this is what I've done anecdotally 
for 30 or 40 years, not just with myself, but with thousands and thousands of clients. So what you cannot study in a performance lab, you personally can study in your own body. You can, you can try different training techniques. Um, you know, there are so many things you just cannot get from a study that, that you're going to read as a, as a peer reviewed, you know, published bit of research, but here's what you can do. You can understand all of these variables. You can think, Hey, what training angles am I using? How does this really affect the muscle tissue? What is the difference between a bench press and a cable crossover? What is the difference for my glutes between a, a hip thrust or a, or a hip abduction with a band or a stiff legged deadlift? You know, what, what, what are all those differences I can do or, or I can train for in terms of muscle fiber type? How many reps am I going to do? How many sets? Uh, all of those things can be experimented with. And, and my final point here, and I'm going to quote Brad again, people want their research to provide answers. They don't. They provide guidelines. Research is never going to tell you what to do. You have to, as an end user, look at all of the research and then put it into practice yourself because you, as a dynamic individual, it's going to play out differently for you than somebody else. But my personal opinion on where the trends are for, for the lifting culture right now Everybody wants to cram in so much frequency, just like my coach who gave me this five-day plan where he's doing all kinds of eclectic movements all stuck together just to try to make it all fit. I'm like, that's not even a workout anymore. That's just a task list. So if you want to enjoy training and feel like you're making progress, I think you need to get a little bit deeper into the workout knowing that you can't apply every variable. You can't train every energy system or every muscle fiber type in every workout. These are things that also have to be cycled, not just your rep ranges. And so when I look at just the deadlift, for example, you can do maximum heavy deadlifts and that's a great workout. You could also do higher rep deadlifts you could also pre-exhaust another back movement into a deadlift for higher reps. You could use the deadlift in part of a giant set for some functional type training. You're going to get all kinds of different results, not just because you're toggling between different rep ranges, but because you're making that an entirely different movement. And, and again, a lot of people just don't, I don't think, have the, the sophistication as a lifter to know how to do these things. So if you love training and you want it to be a maximum part of your progress as, as a competitor, you really have to do these things. I mean, of course we have coaches who can program things for you, but the more depth you have in, in ex exploring it yourself, I think you're going to get more, more out of that. So, uh, that, that ran me right up to an hour. Perfectly. Let me, uh, let, let me get rid of this thing so that we can, um, we can have some Q&A. So anybody have any questions on that? I will I will spend a couple extra minutes here um, as long as you guys are willing and, and we'll go through some, some questions. Go ahead, Dan. Uh, earlier on in your presentation, you talk about uh, developing more mitochondria. Do the mitochondria actually split like a cell or do you actually grow brand new mighty mitochondria? How does that work? Man, I'm going to, I'm going to say, I'm going to give you my answer and then say, I have not looked at this in a long time. So, um, I could be wrong. Maybe, maybe Kevin will know, but you know, satellite cells typically, you know, can, they can, they can replicate in some ways like hyperplasia. But I, I think genetically what you're looking at are stem cells that have the capacity to create that. Because, you know, if you look at a picture of a cell, you know, the, these things aren't like a, a dendrite of, of a neuron that has to have an attachment, like, like, like a root, like from a plant, like here's your, mm -hmm. here's your oak tree. And then, you know, here comes another offshoot for another oak tree to grow. It's not like that. You, you can, you can create new ones as you need for some of those organelles within the cell. Um, but, but, but that whole part of creating 
you know, it, it's an old term. This is not a physiological term, um, cardiovascular density, but I, I've always liked that. It was, it was made popular years ago. Uh, you know, your body is literally creating the ability to create faster energy. So the more mitochondria you have and the better they get at producing energy, the more ATP you have at, at the ready, you know, the more ATP you can resynthesize, the better you can, you know, create more glucose. So when you look at a super high trained athlete, what makes a, a Michael Phelps a better, faster swimmer than somebody else besides genetics is that his physiology has probably been very epigenetically fine tuned for the exact events he's good at. And, and so that's, that, that's why I think Dan, for somebody who wants to, for example, like be a great powerlifter and squat and deadlift heavy, you need, you know, higher rep ranges in that kinetic chain because you need that resiliency. You, you're, you're not going to just do one rep and, and think you're okay. The, the, the stronger you can get with those different energy systems and fiber types will make even your one rep max better as long as you're not training so far away from that, because then all of a sudden it's like taking a, you know, a, a sprinter doing marathon training, hoping that he's going to be a better sprinter because he's doing marathons. Like, no, you can't go all the way over there, but you definitely want to start working the edges. Thanks. Good. Any, any more questions, guys? Was that confusing? Some, some of you who don't have deep physiology backgrounds, did, were you able to get something from that? Or was that all just like a total waste of time? Well, here's, a, here's, a, here's a more basic question. Okay. Uh, when you talked about uh, moderate reps versus high reps, you said you can almost get the same result from the higher reps. Mm. Now, that means that in order to maximize hypertrophy, uh, you've got to stay a little bit more moderate. Would that be a, a logical conclusion? Well, the, 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 the conclusions, and I didn't, I didn't look through all of those citations. So for example, they had 53 citations for this meta-analysis that what they were asserting is that if I just did, you know, 10 sets of 10 for my biceps forever, and that's all I ever did. And then another guy did five sets of 10, but also three sets of eight and two sets of five with heavier weight. So now he's training for more strength, who would actually get the better hypertrophy. And they're saying you don't gain that much more hypertrophy from adding the extra strength work. But that's when I said, it depends on how much a little means to you. You know, if, if 10% yeah. more growth is, is what you want, then, then do the heavy work. Cause you're going to be training those white muscle fibers, you know, even harder. So, you know, I, I think that's almost a conclusion. Like they're saying, you're, you know, you're a teenage boy. You want to, you want to, you want to get big, you know, do you have to become a power lifter? No, you know, you can do moderate, moderate reps forever. And you're going to change the shape of your body substantially. You're going to get 85, 90, 95% of that hypertrophy without ever having to go super heavy. Right. So if you want to be a champion, then uh, you have to take advantage of that. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I don't think I don't think any one of us who who are in it for the aesthetics, who want to be as big as humanly possible, I don't think we would get there without doing a pretty good amount of heavy work. Yeah, okay, I got gotcha. you. Mm -hmm. Steve, you had a question there, Steve Dodd. Uh, well, it's uh, something that's it just dials right into what you're talking about. For years, you know that through. The Weeder schools. Chris Aceto was a big component of me learning, uh, working with him for years. Um, you're spot on what you're saying about weight load, and that, according to them, I mean, the way back in the '80s, they, you know, the biggest correlation to you in development is load, and you have to fill that load as part of your program. Uh, I think hypertrophy back then was uh, somewhere eight to 12 rep range was where the most hypertrophy they saw in muscle, but it still, you had to do the load because if you would go heavier, you would build, develop more strength, which therefore would let you lift a heavier load in the eight to 12 rep range. And, yeah. and they also spoke about, you know, occasionally have to do 
higher rep range work because of the increased development of your oxygen levels and your ability to pick up a heavier load, maybe one more rep. So it all counted. Mm -hmm. But load is, they always talked about the, the load was the biggest component of actually getting stronger and developing better. Yeah, and that's why I like that this particular meta-analysis uh, that Phillips was involved in, you know, looked at strength and hypertrophy differently and then looked at the overlap because you're exactly right. If I just did 10 reps all the time, you know, in two weeks, I can add five pounds and still do 10 reps. In two weeks, I can add five more pounds. So I am getting stronger, but you're never necessarily pushing outside of that boundary. And, and that's why hypertrophy work can stay in a more moderate rep range. And that's, you know, those are the, those energy systems and fiber types in, in play. Um, but even going to the other side, like you said, about working some endurance work, you know, you know, as long as you're not going too far, that's when the heavy work, you know, now we're, we're into more the, the anaerobic energy system and the aerobic energy system. You know, you definitely, I think, want that, that capacity. You just don't want to go too far. But one thing that came to mind as you were saying that, Steve, um, you know, Brett Contreras and Stephen Bogrand, the training director of Pro Physique, you know, when they were giving their presentations along with me and Aaron, um, is it Aaron Stern or Hernie? It's Aaron Stern. Yes. Um, I always get that, that name mixed up. Uh, you know, they both alluded to minimum effective dose. If you're like Brett, Brett would say, I can program women to train their glutes six days a week. But some days it's going to be just kind of light abduction rotational work because you have to recover from the, the harder, more aggressive vertical work. He said, but if two days a week gets you progress, you don't need six. And Stephen Bogran talked about minimum effective dose too. And he said, look, if you're training at level three, you don't go to level 10 without going through level four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Like, you know, and so when you get to the, the point where I'm talking about training as, as aggressively as you can, because you've already, you know, developed as much strength and hypertrophy as you physically possibly can at that level, you know, you're, you're beyond all of that stuff. And you literally are an advanced lifter where you have to really pay attention to these variables, you know, to your advantage. You know, th these are the guys who are trying to get their squat from 900 pounds to a thousand pounds or trying to add that extra pound or two year to year to, to win the next, you know, physique sport contest. So good, good points. What, what do you think about the fact that if you lift for strength, you can develop more muscular endurance, but if you train for muscular endurance, you won't build muscular strength. The second part is definitely true but not the first part. If, if you're training for just strength, you're going to increase your endurance a little bit just because you're active, but you're definitely not going to train for endurance. I mean, yes. you know, and but so, that's the point they made that you could get some muscular endurance from strength training yeah. for strength, but you won't get increased strength from endurance training. So yeah. the only way to get strength is again, they say load. Right. Absolutely. And, and that was something that they even said as meta-analysis. You know, that if you want pure strength, you got to train heavy. Um, anybody else? Any, any questions anybody has? Thanks for some of the things you guys have said here. Um, let me read Andrews here. Starting with the assumption that successfully causing your hypertrophy for trained individuals uh, needs lead to a slight energy surplus. Do you think the reason for not being able to do this successfully uh, in a deficit? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. When you are, when you're in a calorie deficit and you are trying to maintain the same type of frequency and duration, it's definitely not going to work. Uh, you have to respect the energy and the strength deficits. And that's why I personally like to increase frequency at that point, Andrew, if you're in the off season for me and you're eating in a calorie surplus, that's when we're going to go deep into powerlifting type training and you, sometimes you need an entire 48 hours just to recover from that one workout to even work out again, even a different muscle group. But when you're in a calorie deficit, you're getting leaner, your workout should be getting shorter, you're not training as deeply into that training stimulus. So that's when you can start picking up frequency. You know, I will typically progress clients from three days a week to four to five to even six. 
as we get closer and closer to a contest and then, then back off a little bit, but, but all for that reason that you're, you're describing. I have a question. Yes. Sir. Um, would you program somebody differently um, or how would you program them differently for hypertrophy um, if they were more of a fa uh, fast twitch muscle power athlete versus uh, endurance athlete? For example, would you, instead of recommending a heavy, moderate, light day, would you maybe do that one week and then next week recommend like doing a heavy, light, heavy day or something like that, just to kind of take advantage of their muscle types? Mm -hmm. So let me first um, throw a little wrench in your your engine here by saying, if, if you're an athlete training for for strength or for some kind of explosive power, like let's say somebody is a mountain climber and, you know, they need to be able to climb up a mountain and so forth, um, you know, grip strength and so forth. I wouldn't train for hypertrophy at all. Uh, if I have a basketball player in my gym, I'm not training for hypertrophy because they just need power and strength and hypertrophy would slow them down. Now they're carrying around muscle tissue that's not necessarily helpful. So, um, you really do have to know your goals. So if you want, if you want kind of the best of both worlds, if you are a functional athlete and you have a sport, I am right. And that's why I'm answering this way. And I know exactly I know. what you do. Um, you have to be careful of how much weight you're gaining through muscle gain, because it's not going to be efficient for you. Right. Uh, My you only know, conundrum is for bikini competitions, right. uh, the size of the glutes. So it, ever, is, it has been a problem and, and, um, it does add weight, extra weight I have to carry around, but, um, I, I'm trying to weigh it out the best I can. Yeah. So I'll answer this way. Have, have you seen American Ninja Warrior? Uh-huh. So, uh, who does better, uh, uh, a climbers. six foot six, 300 pound defensive end or a, or a 135 pound guy with no muscle? Yeah. <laughs> you know, same Power height. Athlete, yeah. Yeah. But so it's the person who's super light that maintains a higher strength ratio in overall power and strength. The 300 pound football player is going to have it all day long. But, but when you're doing something in a sport that you're involved in, but I, I don't think you have to worry about it that much. You can still have incredibly strong, dense, you know, glutes and strength and still be light enough just because of your body composition. And so I would say, you know, absolutely, you're going to be in that sweet spot that I love. You know, my entire career of training has never been to be as strong as I possibly can. It's to be as strong as I can within the framework of maximum hypertrophy. I, I never wanted just hypertrophy. I'm, I'm not a guy who's just going to do 10 reps and go home. I love strength but strength was never my ultimate goal. It was how I looked on stage. And so I probably gave up a little bit of strength for my, my primary goal. You may have to give up a little bit, you know, for your primary goal, either way, if your goal right now is, is aesthetically how you look, you may carry around an extra couple pounds. And so, you know, it, it impedes your grip strength or your pull-up strength. But. I, um, so as my glutes, grew to compensate for climbing, I had to build my, or strengthen my core. So I had to work mm -hmm. those in tandem. Um, so I know I'll have a little bit of that, but the feedback that I've received from previous competitions was to come in a little bit more fuller in the glutes. And so that's specifically when I um, train, most of my training is surrounded around glute training. And then my upper body is mostly climbing just so I don't come in too hard or unbalanced. Yeah. Th this is where it, it, it does get tough training for a sport and for a physique application um, because you still want to pay attention to getting everything you can out of it. So if, if you know, B Brett Contreras would be the first person to tell you, if you only have one exercise you can do for the glutes, do a deadlift. Like forget the mm -hmm. hip thrust, forget the band rotation, forget all this because you want to maximally contract, you know, here, here's an exercise I do all the time. I just did it with my daughter the other day because she's really becoming a meathead. Um, you know, you know, stick your hand out like you're going to shake somebody's hand 
and, and I wish I was there to do this with you. And I said, okay, you just, you know, I didn't give her any instructions. Just shake my hand and squeeze as hard as you can. She immediately put her hand right here and squeezed. And then I did this. I extended her wrist as far as it would go. And I said, okay, now squeeze. And there was no strength. She started laughing. And then I flexed her wrist. And I said, now squeeze as hard as you can squeeze my hand. And there was no power. And I said, you only have the maximum strength at one exact position in the joint because that's when the muscle fibers are aligned between origin and insertion for maximum contraction. That's why something like a deadlift or a stiff-legged deadlift with 400 pounds is always going to be better for your glutes than a little hip band abduction with five pounds um, or you know even a hip thrust that's very you know, isolatory doesn't mean you can't do those other things and doesn't mean you shouldn't, but you know, major on the majors first, you know, you, you got to build the barn before you can paint the barn. And so do the heavy, hard work that makes those muscle fiber and go, go all the way back to those sarcomeres. When I, you know, my very first couple slides, all a muscle does is contract these Z lines together. That's, that's all it does. It doesn't care what's happening. It's how much force is required to go from here to here. And if I can make them do this with 400 pounds, I'm going to have a lot better adaptive response than if I make them do it with five or 10 pounds. So, you know, do all of the things that make you stronger and better at your sport. But when you want pure maximum hypertrophy, which is what my lecture was about today, then you've got to make sure you're really working on, on the most effective exercises in, in the most effective rep ranges and load. So for hypertrophy, you said deadlift. If I was going to pick one, hip thrusts and deadlifts. Well, again, it, it's it's you, you can use those exercises for both. You know, okay. I, I, I'm never going to get my glutes strong if I just do a rotational exercise. I have to do a vertical exercise because <clears throat> that's how the glutes contract maximally, just like my handshake experiment. But now I can train in different rep ranges and within different loads with that particular exercise. And so you get, you have to make all of those change, all of those decisions with every single exercise. How am I going to apply this? How, how, you know, how many days do I do this exercise? What should my rep range be? What's my, you know, uh, perceived intensity or my reps in reserve. I mean, these are all the variables you have to apply to every single exercise in every single workout. Okay. But we can definitely talk about that in, in your own training for sure. But that was that was a great example.